Omer, thank you very much. Um, now, as you can imagine, as a chair, I'm in a very <laughs> unenviable position right now because um, what we've heard, um, what we've heard uh, essentially are uh, two very different takes on two really very different, though of course interrelated debates. And uh, it would be extremely unfair not to uh, give Dirk Moses an opportunity to respond to Omer Bato's critique. On the one hand, on the other hand, um, I would also very much like to actually have a debate that everyone can participate in. So what I suggest we do is that uh, if anyone has a question or comment on either part of what we've just heard, um, that you speak now, and then uh, we give Dirk and then also Omer uh, an opportunity to respond both to all of you and to each other. Um, sorry, Misha, I want to pull uh, rank for a second and suggest that it's only fair to let uh, Dirk respond at least briefly and then to open the floor. Okay, thanks, Susan. Uh, uh, I've read Omer's uh, piece already because it's part of a book forum that's coming out. So I, I knew what he was going to say. So, uh, you know, nothing surprises me. Uh, needless to say, I reject uh, virtually everything he said. If there's any paranoia uh, on display here, it's in his reading of the book. Uh, it doesn't argue that there's a conspiracy among Jewish lawyers like Lemke and Lauterpacht or others to push through a particular interpretation uh, of mass criminality to shield Israel from, uh, from uh, scrutiny. In fact, it argues that Lemkin, as Omer did say, invented a bridging concept uh, to uh, unite the experiences of uh, Christians in Europe during first and second world war, occupied Poland and so forth. Andrews, so that a politically effective coalition between the governments in exile, the Polish government exile, the French government exile, and so forth, could unite with the World Jewish Congress, which with which they were in tension, because the intensive debate about war crimes trials in 1942 and 43, which were on the horizon already, so before Nuremberg, uh, were debates taking place among these governments in exile, and you know the World Jewish Congress is not a uh, it's not an estate, okay? It's, a, it's an NGO. And they were rebuffed as part of these negotiations. Uh, and they were, in, I've used, researched their papers, which are an incredibly useful resource. They're in Cincinnati, Ohio. And uh, the correspondence is, is deeply fascinating and important. And Lemkin is involved in the periphery of these circles as well, because he comes up with the concept of genocide as part of these debates and war crimes trials. Now, he, he, he comes up with this bridging concept because he observes that the anti-Semitism in the US where he's living means that the public and the government aren't that interested in what's happening to Jews in Europe in 1942 and 43. They understand national socialism as a anti-Christian crime, above all, because these were Christian countries on the whole, right? or overwhelmingly Christian countries. And so he thinks, well, the way to get some, you know, to Christians to care about us is to unite our suffering. So he invents a sort of ecumenical concept. Now, within the World Jewish Congress, there's some resistance to that because they want a particular Jewish indictment, as they call it, at Nuremberg, crime against the Jewish people, which is rejected as well by the War Crimes uh, Commission. That's the, you can follow these, these, um, this sort of somewhat wrenching correspondence in detail in the archives. Now, What's significant is not the interpretation we heard just then, where somehow these, this cabal of Jewish thinkers and organizations push it through. What's significant is that this idea is taken up by the powers, by great powers, uh, and by members of the General Assembly. It becomes useful for them so their states, whether communist or anti-communist, can suppress domestic opposition. So the real drama, as explained in the book, if you, if you read it in a non-paranoid way, is the cynicism of states at the United Nations in limiting, in restricting Lemkin's very broad, in many ways, admirable definition of genocide um, so that they can engage in uh, systematic bombing of civilians against enemies and suppression of uh, you know, subversives uh, in, in, internally because 
um, political crimes are not criminalized. Uh, genocide is an ethnic crime. Now, Lemkin Zionism is relevant to the extent that he's, the political imaginary is ethnic, as it was for the so-called small nations of Europe. So I, I, I couple those in, in various chapters, a small nations mentality, the Czechs, the Slovaks, and so forth, regard themselves as the small nations of, of Europe and, and, and you know, whose identity is fragile and, and uh, or, or at least under threat by you know, Germany on one side, Russia on the other. Now, you're gonna to have to read the book for the details. Now, and I'll finish with this, Misha. Uh, Professor Bartov then actually repeated my argument, once again, misunderstanding it, when he said, you know, the, 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 the Holocaust is actually a political crime. Yes, that's the point of chapter seven. The Nazis understood their crime and the, uh, against the Jews as a political crime. And that's the point of permanent security. Uh, people are securitized and racialized as enemies who need to be neutralized. And permanent warfare, by the way, is permanent security. Once again, a complete misreading of the text. Haven't we been engaged right now in a debate about forever wars, never ending wars? That is permanent security in action, as was the Nazi idea of permanent warfare for a thousand year right, which sounds very much like permanence, uh, as far as I can tell. The point is, is that the Holocaust was interpreted afterwards as purely a hate crime. You know, killing a group as such means killing them solely or members of that group solely because they're members of that group, not for anything they've done, not because they prevent, present a political threat, but purely because their identity is, is inimical to you. Okay? So it's a complete misreading of the book. Uh, and there are many others, but we don't have time. Thanks a lot for, for keeping it short. And once again, um, since, since our time is very limited, um, I do want to give people the opportunity to speak. Um, starting with Ben Zachariah, who had raised his hand. So as part of my homework for this workshop, I reread Lemkin's chapter. And I don't uh, actually recognize uh, the argument that Professor Bartov attributes to Dirk Moses. I want to ask, uh, in the question of whether uh, Lemkin meant to prioritize the killing of Jews or not, uh, or whether in uh, Dirk Moses' return to that question, in the question of whether states interpreted it in that way to prioritize ethnicization or not, um, how do you read intention? Because I think it really hinges on trying to read intention in a set of sources. And I'm always doubtful that you can. Who would like to respond to that? Is this a question to me? I, I wasn't sure. Well, it was a general question, but I suppose it uh, it applies to both. Or uh, to elaborate on that, how does Professor Bartov think that uh, Professor Moses reads intention? And how does Professor Moses think that he reads intention? <laughs> okay, that's, that's, a, that's a sophisticated question. Well, um, my reading of um, what um, Dirk is writing is that he thinks that the um, concept of intention um, is too problematic to be included, whereas in, in a definition of genocide or uh, that in fact that is one of the problems with the concept of genocide, whereas for Lemkin, uh, and in the genocide resolution itself, as you must know, uh, intention is cardinal. And in many ways, that's the main difference between uh, crimes against humanity and genocide. Um, so in that sense, there is a, a major, um, this crucial importance to the notion of intention. And intention, of course, is, very difficult to determine. Uh, the Nazis made it a bit easier for people because they declare their intention, but often in cases of genocide, it's more difficult to document that. And that has been one of the criticisms of the UN definition of genocide, but it still holds to this day, whether we like it or not. Um, I just add that, um, um, Dirk was just saying, uh, talking about Lemkin's admirable definition, or in many ways admirable definition of genocide, 
Um, but Dick actually disagrees with that definition of genocide and he disagrees with it precisely because that definition is ethnic and national. And he would rather it had covered also political categories and social categories, uh, which were rejected eventually um, before the, the resolution was accepted. Uh, now there are reasons to be uh, critical of uh, having avoided those um, categories. And we know why they, they were um, rejected um, by many member states. Uh, the, the, the US, the USSR, France, Britain, they all had reasons not to want that to be included. But it must be said also that there is a problem including such categories because if you want to keep to the concept of genocide and not reject it altogether, then any persecution of any political group in any country could be termed as genocide. And, and that would mean that we um, would be facing such a multitude of genocides uh, that the concept itself arguably would be emptied of its meaning. And one last point I'd like to make is regarding permanent security. If indeed we say that the current, say this concept of permanent war against terrorism and Nazi policies are both instances of uh, countries seeking permanent security, are we not then saying that there's no difference between the two? And therefore, again, we are stretching a concept so wide that we can't actually make distinctions between America's highly lamentable wars in Iraq and Afghanistan or wherever the United States has gone and Nazi policies. And we're saying, well, it's basically all the same. It's all seeking permanent security. Uh, so in, in, in that sense, I would say that I'm more conservative in terms of definitions, both of the definition of genocide and the definition of if, if we need that term permanent security, I'm not sure if we need it, um, but if we do, then to define it in such a way that it does not include every country's uh, perceived policies of following its own national interests for as long as that country exists. Thank you. No, you don't want to? Okay, thanks, thanks a lot. Um, I just want to remind the audience that um, even though the, the debate on, on the book, which I guess most people here have not read, has kind of overshadowed um, our, our discussion in this, uh, in this session, um, there was also Dirk's talk itself, um, which, which really covers um, a different kind of ground. And I would like to invite and encourage people to also comment on that. So if anyone has any responses, questions, concerns, now is the time to voice them. Yes, Michael Bild. Um, yeah, I would like to ask something about the uh, German catech catechism uh, article, uh, which is the only thing by Dirk Moses, which I've read. Um, I'm, in a sense, I'm wondering what, what is your intention in the longer run? You said you, there's a shakeup needed in Germany uh, regarding uh, remembrance policy. But my question is, or, or reading that article, I found myself on the one hand agreeing with you in many points uh, and uh, yeah, agreeing also to that notion of a shakeup. Uh, but on the other hand, I'm, I'm wondering, aren't you lumping conservatives and progressive forces in Germany together in a way that is problematic. Because if you, you know, con conservatives, or well, let's say the, 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 the catechism that we have today in a sense was a major victory of the left of progressive forces in Germany. Uh, perhaps one of the few cultural victories of the, of the left in Germany and um, I do see the problem that conservatives are trying to pre, uh, to co-opt that victory for their purposes. Um, but your criticism at the same time seems to undermine, I think, that victory of the left. And, and that's so that is my question where shouldn't you shouldn't one more clearly distinguish between people 
academics, grassroots activists, um, historians uh, at the local level, etc., who fought for that remembrance policy for many decades. And then, um, yeah, um, politicians nowadays that try to kind of uh, sacralize the Holocaust in, in, you know, in problematic ways. Yeah, thanks for that question. I've written about four follow-up articles uh, in the German press. So in there, I, you know, have more space than a short blog to elaborate on some of these points. And uh, I make it clear to some, you know, worried readers that I'm not condemning all the all the positive aspects you're mentioning, progressive aspects from the 80s. On the contrary, what I'm arguing is that it's been distorted, as you saw from my talk today, right? It's been verstaatlich to some extent. There's now this Staatsräson, and, and we now have Staatsbeauftragte, and uh, there's a resolutions. You know, I mentioned that, and then people go, no, there's auf keinen Fall gibt es eine Verstaatlichung. But you say, well, there are all these state institutions now, and, you know, the, 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 the weight of the state is bearing down on people. Uh, because let's not forget that uh, in this country, unlike in the US and Australia, the state funds m far more culture and academic life. Right? So the, the, the tentacles of influence, power, cancellation, uh, you know, reach much deeper in society. So, and that's what concerns me. And uh, I think if, if, uh, uh, if that could you know, be removed, then the, the, the grassroots could come back to life that I think we both admire. Now, let, one thing I want to, uh, you know, reiterate or underline from my talk here is uh, the energy, the Vergangenheitsbewältigung energy in the 90s was pro-multiculturalism. Now for many, it's become anti-multiculturalism, including for some members of the left. So I, that's why I talked about a consensus from the RFD to the anti-Deutschen, which is Islamophobic. Uh, and that needs to be confronted when you talk about the progressive voices in this country. There needs to be some serious self-examination in this respect. Tjellwild, who's next? Um, I'm sorry that I speak German, but to, uh, to be sure to um, comment precisely. I think this is a schönes Beispiel für eine scholarly debate and a public response, because uh, weil das Problem des, des Begriffs des Genozids zum einen, genau wie eure Kontroverse es zeigt, ja, aus, ent, entsteht durch das Konzept von Raphael Lemkin ein neues Verbrechen, das er wahrnimmt im Zweiten Weltkrieg, auch mit einem neuen Terminus, den er selber erfindet, zu bezeichnen. Auf der anderen Seite, dieser Terminus, dieses Strab, dieser, dieses, dieser, dieses Verbrechen in eine politische, völkerrechtliche Form gebracht wird, die entsprechend auch jetzt Omas Argument natürlich äh, jetzt politischen Interessen unterliegt, bestimmte, bestimmte Bestände, die noch oder bestimmte Kriterien, die Raphael Lemkin im Kopf hatte, wie zum Beispiel politische Verfolgung, aus politischen Gründen aus dieser Resolution 1948 entfernt wird. Wichtig aber nach wie vor Intention, Absicht in der, in der Genozidkonvention enthalten ist. Also wir eine, einen Begriff haben, der aus der Wahrnehmung, der Beobachtung der Massenverbrechen des Zweiten Weltkriegs entsteht. Daraus die Absicht wird, der in der UNO versammelten Nationen solche Verbrechen künftig völkerrechtlich zu ahnen und zugleich damit aber auch ein, ein wissenschaftlicher Terminus entsteht, der aber äh, Shortfalls hat. Also ist Intention nachweisbar? Manche Täter sprechen über ihre Intention, andere sprechen darüber nicht. Manche sagen, dass sie bestimmte Intentionen haben. Wir analytisch analysieren aber, dass eine Reihe von anderen Legitimationen oder Begründungen oder Antriebe, Motive sie zu deren Massenverbrechen leiten. Und dieses Konglomerat, glaube ich, ist ein Beispiel dafür, dass man in der öffentlichen, also wenn man in der Öffentlichkeit sagt, der Holocaust war kein Genozid, in eine sozusagen verkürzte Debatte kommt, die genau all diese Facetten, Dimensionen, Problematiken nicht, nicht enthält und auch nicht eindeutig lösen kann. 
Also eins, nicht was, was ihr beide aufgeworfen habt, lässt sich dieser Begriff des Genozids, der 19, in, sozusagen im Zweiten Weltkrieg entsteht, eigentlich rückverfolgen auf Massenverbrechen, die vor dem Zweiten Weltkrieg stattgefunden haben. Was wir mit dem armenischen Genozid oder dem Genozid an Herero und Nama tun. Aber da sozusagen in der Entwicklung dieses Begriffs dadurch ein Problem entsteht. Er ist entstanden und in der spezifischen Situation lässt er sich als Begriff auf Situationen, auf Massengewalt beziehen, die vor dem Zweiten Weltkrieg stehen. Und das ist, glaube ich, so eine sehr gute, also die meisten von uns, die wir hier sitzen, kennen das Buch, können eure Kontroverse nicht äh, kompetent kompetieren, weil wir das Buch nicht gelesen haben, also ähm, oder nur Teile des Buch gelesen haben. Ähm, aber ich glaube, es ist ein gutes Beispiel dafür, ähm, dass auf der einen Seite, also dann das bestimmte erinnerungspolitische Debatten, die unter diesem Begriff, ist der Holocaust ein Genozid oder nicht, äh, nur begrenzt das Problem erreichen, zu schnell zu Schlüssen kommen, die scheinbar eindeutig sind. Und auf der anderen Seite aber gerade eine solche Kontroverse zeigt, wie produktiv es ist, darüber nachzudenken. Und dass man eben nicht zu, ein, zu schnellen Schlüssen kommen kann, sondern genau mit einer solchen Kontroverse wie von euch jetzt äh, mit dem Buch äh, aufgefordert ist, einfach nochmal auch über die eigenen erinnerungspolitischen äh, Reden nachzudenken. Would anyone like to respond to that? Okay. Yeah, we, we're already um, almost cutting into our, our coffee break, but I had uh, Susan and then Manuel Kessler and I think Francisca has some. Okay, let's um, let's try to go quickly to the extent that's possible. Okay, I had a question for Omar about uh, hate crimes, but in the interest of time, I'm going to leave that because it gets more complicated. Um, I think the last or next to last questioner brought up a real serious problem in this whole debate, and that's the question of Verstaatlichung, um, which is, after all, um, the same thing that was, uh, you know, and continues to be uh, thrown at the DDR about Verordneter Antifaschismus. Um, I'm by no means <laughs> happy with what's going on in the last year and a half. I don't think any Jew living in Germany has been subject to more abuse, um, you know, but the worst thing uh, that's happened to me is being called an anti-Semite, um, you know, but I mean, it's not pleasant when the, you know, federal anti-Semitism commissioner calls you an anti-Semite, but, um, you know, I'm obviously I'm privileged. Um, nevertheless, so, so I, I don't want to minimize at all the problems that have developed in the last couple of years, which I think can be explained. I think they have to do with the, um, the AfDs coming into power in 2017 and the really hysterical reaction towards that by other parties in Germany. They're serious and um, other people are hurting a lot more than I have under that. Nevertheless, we have a real paradox. We want certain things to become part of a national consciousness. And yet once they do, um, we run into the kinds of McCarthyist tendencies that one is beginning to see in the United States in certain forms of you know, woke uh, behavior at the New York Times, say, or other places. So I'm very troubled by all this. And I wonder if you have anything to say about it. Either of you, I guess. I can I can jump in a, a minute to respond to a couple of things, if I may. Please do. Um, two, two, two things that occur to me. I think it's uh, related to what Susan was saying. One is the previous comment, which I thought was a very interesting comment, and I'll just say that we don't have time for this whole debate now. But the 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 sort of novelty of what Lemkin came up with is, of course something that predates World War II. And his, his thinking, as, as Dirk shows, is pre-World War II thinking. And what he argues is that there is a particular crime in which even if you don't kill many people or no people at all, if you destroy a particular 
ethnic group, a particular culture, that is a tragedy on its own. And that's why this concept of a, a group as such is important. Now, one can debate that, one can disagree with that um, or not, but, but his concept is that the destruction of any group, a, a Polish nation or Russian nation or a Jewish nation, um, even if it's only by uh, limiting their fertility, by taking away their children, not by killing them, that is a tragedy. And, and that's really what is the driving force behind this particular concept of genocide. If you expand it to other categories and you're talking about something else and one can do it, but the fact of the matter is that the UN basically voted for this kind of definition of genocide. And my argument would be that it's better to have a definition against one kind of genocide, which indeed was part of what um, Nazi Germany was engaged in, uh, than not to have one at all. That's, that's one thing. The, the second is on this notion of hate crime. Now, um, um, no, to, to my knowledge, no genocidal regime uh, is motivated uh, to kill people as a hate crime. And I don't think that in Germany after World War II, in post-war Germany, people talked about the murder of the Jews as a hate crime. On the contrary, they prefer to think about it as a political crime, as something that was done by a regime that they didn't have much to do with, or they just had to follow a certain policy, uh, but there was no hate involved. And if you want to think about the long trajectory of this question, you can say that the big shock and tremor that occurred in Germany when Goldhagen came on his uh, Triumphzug to uh, Germany, it was because he said, oh, the Germans actually hate the Jews. And for um, the German public at the time, uh, this was quite shocking, both for the public and for the, 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 the historical truth, because it was not seen as a hate crime. Now, where there is a predilection to think of such crimes as hate crimes is in the United States. Uh, and that has to do with, with a particular dynamic of discussion about crimes and empathy and uh, um, uh, um, uh, um, um, uh, non-prejudice and tolerance that, that has to do with the particularities of American debates on that. But by and large, we don't think, not now, nor the regimes at the time, thought of Stalin's crimes or of Hitler's crimes or of the crimes in Kampuchea or of what happened uh, with the Herero or what happened in, 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 in Rwanda as hate crimes. These are policy driven crimes. They're transmitted as such. And that is what in fact uh, identifies them as genocide. So I, I just think that this term again is not particularly useful unless we are talking about a kind of lose public debate or the way this is taught in uh, schools in the United States. States points, maybe? No? Okay. Okay, uh, Mario. Okay, just uh, just, uh, um, just a brief addition to uh, Una Bartov. In, in addition to Lemkin's uh, uh, term genocide, uh, his fellow Paul Isaac Deutscher, um, Coined in his uh, coined in his Trotsky biography, Trotsky biography is the term uh, political uh, genocide, and he meant exactly um, that uh, that during the Stalinist purges, all possible enemies from from other, particularly from other left wing camps, Bukharinists, uh, Zinovievists, of course Trotskyists, but also social revolutionaries and uh, and uh, and Mensheviks and all possible. Um, uh, you know, op the opponents to Stalin had been had been eradicated. So in the end, after Stalin's death in, 1950, in, in 1956, um, it was uh, it, it was the Stalinists themselves who had to do, who, who 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 had to de-Stalinize the the, the uh, Soviet Union, and and if they did so, they could not come. Uh, they they did not, not they were unable to leave the realm of Stalinism. And if they did it in 1985, uh, then it, then it was certainly too late, and the window of of, of opportunity to, to reform socialism was gone. Just in brief, uh, thank you very much. 
I don't continue um, right away. No, I'm sorry, because we're already eating into the coffee break. We have uh, one or several questions that Francesca wanted to, to voice from uh, the Zoom chat. But... Um, first of all, hi, Omar, you don't know me personally, but uh, I was your publisher. I'm Michael Norman of Robot. So I just uh, reread a book of yours with a wonderful dedication, which I did not deserve, really. Uh, because it was an editor who's not alive anymore who brought you to a robot. Now, uh, I'm in a unique position in this circle here to have been representing the state in the official uh, Holocaust memorial activities of uh, a particular government, the Schroeder government, which indeed claimed, as uh, my colleague here said on, on my left, a claim to have been a, a member of the generation which against lots of resistance by these conservative forces of the Adenauer years and the post-Adenauer post years, uh, who pushed basically uh, the issue of remembrance and, and sham, indeed, uh, in, in West Germany uh, pertaining to the Holocaust. But if you then are, uh, and to pick up uh, Susan's argument, if you then are in a peculiar position to certainly understand that the institutionalization of remembrance by the state has all the concomitant uh, issues and dangers uh, that, that accompany any memorial, whether it's a Holocaust memorial or God knows what else memorial. And I'm not reminding you of the Southern States memorial debates uh, of Robert E. Lee and others. Uh, these, these memorials have, as Musil said, the tendency to disappear from the public consciousness. I think there are over 60 memorials in Washington, D.C. Uh, uh, honoring famous uh, foreign heroes. Uh, and nobody knows who they are. Uh, this is different in Germany. And if you suddenly are, as I was in the position, to understand the, uh, the intellectual shortcomings of an institutionalized memory and still have to basically carry it through, uh, you learn a lot about oneself but also about the unavoidable uh, pitfalls that come along with these kind of memorial work by the state. The pitfalls are clear. Um, I was originally against the memorial precisely of this reason, the Holocaust Memorial, because I thought this will basically be the famous Schlussstrich and then we won't talk about it anymore. It's basically an artwork straight out of New Mexico in the center of land art in the center of Berlin. So our compromise then was to produce this Orte Information. But what I later learned that during the, during the uh, uh, campaign, during the election campaign, when I had made public that I'm really not in favor of that memorial, uh, a leading member of the Social Democratic Party, which was during the election campaign polling weekly, the attitudes of the Germans told me that my position uh, brought the SPD 100,000 additional votes in West Berlin, in Berlin. In other words, the majority of the Germans did not want that memorial. Let's be clear about that. But then once it was there, it does serve its purpose. So it's this quasi tragic role of the state, which does things that uh, carry the danger of institutionalization and therefore petrifying reality into official memory uh, also serves a purpose uh, which may be uh, stronger than the criticism like mine, uh, or if, in fact, the criticism of the conservatives. So it's not tragic, but it's more ambivalent, this debate of institutionalizing uh, mem memory by the state. And after all, and then I'll come to the end of it, the, uh, the core of memory work, terrible German word, Erinnerungsarbeit, is, of course it's not Arbeit, but anyway, the core of that is indeed performed by employees of the states. That is the German Professor. You all are member of the state. You're not an individual working on your own, except your Remsma and others who just happen to have millions. Sorry. Okay, we're now in the middle of our coffee break, uh, I'm sorry to say. So why don't we take some final questions from our Zoom audience? 
Just a comment. So Just a comment. It's, okay. it's a comment and I would like to read it because it um, came from the Zoom audience. Um, I think the historian's dispute is more an emotional issue that cannot be resolved with factual arguments alone. It mainly shows that the National Socialist and the Holocaust, National Socialism and the Holocaust have not been emotionally reappraised. The historical facts have been dealt with well, but not the collective feelings of guilt and shame. In the whole German society, many had an advantage, for example, by the pub publicly advertised sale of uh, households of the deported Jewish families. This guilt and shame is hardly addressed, but is passed on to the following generations. So that's a comment on, on the talk. So. so now, why don't we give uh, Omar and Dirk an opportunity for just a few final words. You, Dirk, you in particular maybe should say something about this whole issue of the state. I, I, I would just like to thank uh, Herr Naumann for being here, honoring us with your presence. Uh, and well, I remember your work well when I was a student here over 20 years ago. It was, you know, memory, good memory work in action. And uh, I, I'm suggesting uh, what you've just said and, and can, only, can only agree about this, this ambivalence, which, which means that we need a vibrant civil society, which you know, exists in, in a kind of productive tension with the state. At the moment, it's the tension is being resolved a bit far in one direction. That's the problem, okay. All right, thank you for being so concise. Um, Omer, I don't know if you want to add anything, but, but I'm hoping that you can also stay with us for the remainder of the, of the conference. Um, I, I can't because I have to go to another conference, I'm afraid. I just want to also thank uh, everyone and thank um, uh, Nauman, because it made me think again, of course, um, and I've been involved in that in the politics of memory in my own uh, homeland in Israel and the whole debate about the creation of the memorial of the Holocaust there, how complex that is, how on the one hand, Yad Vashem is certainly used as a political tool uh, and as an educational or, if you like, indoctrinational tool. And on the other hand, how impossible it would be to think of the state of Israel not having a Holocaust memorial. And so this tension between what becomes of it and how it is used, memory and its commemoration, and yet at the same time, the, the absolute impossibility of not having it. And so I think that ultimately we are all left I think with the responsibility to help ourselves, help our students and, and the public to deal with these kinds of memories and these kind of sites of commemoration in a way that would bring us the, the sort of lessons that we hope that people will draw rather than to, as they often do, uh, take us off the hook. All right, thanks uh, a lot. Uh, thank you to both of our speakers. Uh, thanks a lot to the audience. We're now technically at the end of our coffee break. So what I suggest is that we take 10 minutes uh, for an actual break and then uh, reconvene here for the next session.